reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, and can be found on page 967 of the Church Bible. The Temptation of Jesus. When Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. This is the word of the Lord. So, Father God, we just thank you for your word that's going to be that's just spoken, and for Tim for giving us things to feast about, feast upon. So, bless him, pour out your spirit upon him, anoint that word, and ready our hearts, Lord, to receive it. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, I'm going to start with something a bit silly. Who thinks temptation looks like this? Or maybe it looks like this. Or maybe it looks like this. Or maybe, if it all sounds too good to be true, it looks like this. Of course, those are some in some ways silly examples, but in some ways real examples that we face day in, day out. Those times when we have different voices saying to us, well, go on, you know you really want to. No, you shouldn't. When I was in family church in February, uh, Steve was leading, and he had us going round when we faced those temptations. And there was, I think it was Carol trying to tempt us and Julia trying not to. I can't remember which way around it was, but there were those different voices. I go through temptation in some ways most of the time when I think about unhealthy food. I'm terrible. At the moment, I'm trying to get back to eating according to Slimming World to shift some of this. But whenever I walk into that co-op, what's the first thing that greets me? Well, it's not quite the first thing, but it's the donut stand. And I stand there and I go, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? And usually I go, yes, I will. (laughs) And then I get really sad when I stand on the scales and realize the weight's going in the wrong direction. For those of you that have come to Church House, you'll notice you've never been offered biscuits. There's a very good reason for that. Once the biscuit packet's open, that's it, they're gone. <laughs> if we have them, so we don't, Amanda and I don't buy them. Those are some examples. But what temptations do we face in our lives today? Well, if we think about it, pretty much everywhere we go, we are facing temptation. If you drive or you walk somewhere, you see billboards displaying things that are the latest must-have. And guess what? You can't live without this thing, even though we've been living for however many years before without it. If we sit down and watch TV, during the advert breaks, there are always products that are the next best thing. Look 20 years younger. Do this and you want a new car, it's more environmentally friendly. So much of TV is about advertising and companies pay millions of pounds to get those adverts out onto the TV. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, 
but it depends on what you're watching as to what advert is actually shown. So when I'm watching cycling highlights, every single advert is usually either for an exercise bike, for a spin class, for the latest and greatest sports drink, or Halfords. Last year in the Tour de France, I played a game with Amanda and I said, I can tell you what the next four adverts are going to be. And do you know what? I got four out of four. <laughs> I'm coming on to that. <laughs> if we watch things like the Great British Bake Off, it's food items that are for sale. Or do you need a new kitchen? Yours clearly isn't good enough. That's how advertising works. Advertising works to the audience by trying to tempt you into something that you probably don't actually need. And obviously, if you do need a new car, fair enough. If you need a new kitchen, fair enough. But if you're like me, maybe you record things on TV, because I'm never at home to watch them in time uh, when they're broadcast. And I always fast forward the adverts, because I get so fed up of them. But if you read a newspaper or a magazine, what's in them? Adverts. If you play a game on your mobile phone or your tablet and you haven't paid for it, what's in it? Adverts. Now, of course, I understand why on those things you pay for it to be ad-free, because the developers do need the money. I get that. It may be as you go into a shop. In Bentham, there was a shop called Temptations. And Amanda wasn't allowed in there unsupervised <laughs> unless I had hold of her purse. <laughs> Funnily enough, the shop sold material, wool, fabric, and all sorts of different crafty things. But the simple fact is that we live in a world of temptation. I've not even touched on things to do with the internet, where now our adverts are targeted at us it uses the cookies as we go on the different website. When we then go on to another website, it advertises what we've just looked at. Doesn't even go into that. And of course, I haven't gone down the darker side of things on the internet, which we all know exist, and we pray against. But if we were to stop and think now, I wonder how many temptations have you had this morning from waking up this morning in your bed to right now sat in the house of God. How many temptations have you faced? I guess the next question would be, have you given in to any of them? Not yet, a good answer. Now, I'm not trying to make us all feel bad. It's just a way of realizing how often that we are tempted in today's world. Of course, this morning we had the well-known story of Jesus being tempted in the desert. It all comes on the first Sunday of Lent, no matter which year of the lectionary we're in. It's the temptation of Jesus, because Lent is the time when we remember Jesus in the wilderness. He goes into the desert after his baptism, and he's tempted by the enemy three times. It's also it's a time when he can reflect on what he's about to do. It comes at the start of his ministry. It's a time when we as Christians can also reflect on what God is asking for us. I want us to look at the screen. So I've got a video, which is a series of uh, illustrations by a British artist. So we're going to watch the video and then we'll carry on. So the background to our gospel passage this morning is likely from Deuteronomy 8. Moses is recalling how God led the Israelites into the desert for 40 years and the purpose behind it, to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Now we know that Israel fails in this task. They tempted God at Meribah and Massah they were idolatrous with the golden calf, and they grabbed at the manna in the wilderness. But Jesus doesn't fail in the desert for 40 days. It also fits in with the narrative. Jesus is baptized in the River Jordan. The Israelites cross the Red Sea when it's parted. Israel in the desert for 40 years, Jesus for 40 days. Israel fails, but Jesus succeeds. 
And if we go to Matthew 4.16, Jesus brings light to the world, which is what God always wanted Israel to do. But I believe at the very heart of these temptations that Jesus faces, it's about his vocation. It goes to the very root of who he is. The first two temptations start, if you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. The enemy is going straight for Jesus' identity. And if we'd have read the verse before chapter 4, it's Matthew 3, 17, where the, where the voice from heaven says, This is my Son, whom I love, and I am well pleased. So Jesus has this experience. Charles talked about it last week on Transfiguration Sunday, about the mountaintops and the valley lows. He has that wonderful experience of the Father saying, This is my Son, whom I love. And straight after, in the desert, the enemy comes and says, if you're the son of God, he attacks him straight away. Because for us, it's when we have those big experiences of the Lord, when we have those times when we're feeling great, that straight away temptation comes in. And I'm not talking about the food that I used at the start. It's temptation to do the other thing. It's temptation to not follow what the Lord has just given you. If the Lord has said to you, go and start off this wonderful ministry. Charles spoke about his last week, this ministry he started. If his, he got that word from the Lord, if the temptation straight after would likely be, well, you don't need to do that. You need to charge for that. But Charles didn't give in and he carried on. It's an example. And we have those times from the Lord where he really speaks the enemy will come straight in and try and knock you flat on your face. When I was first sent that call to ordination, I sat for 20 minutes in front of my vicar with my jaw on the floor. And then I had doubts. <laughs> You're not good enough for that. You really think you can lead a church? You can't possibly speak in public and preach the word of God. To name a few. But believe me, those three I've just shared with you, I wake up some days, even now, and still think, but I'm not good enough to lead a church. How am I supposed to stand up and preach the word of God? I'm not good enough for this. I know that those things, when they come, though, are not of the Lord. But I also know that I can't do what I do without the Lord. There is no way that I can stand up here and preach without God's Holy Spirit living in me. And in some ways, when I say those things, it's the enemy that's going to the heart of who I am, of the calling that God has placed on my life. I remember the morning of the 2nd of May last year when the bishop rung me up and invited me to take this post as vicar here. Of course, I was very kind to the bishop and warmly accepted. I hung up the phone and then thought, oh, that's the polite version. <laughs> what on earth do I do now? Straight away, straight away, my identity was challenged. And those temptations that come from the enemy go much deeper than our calling. Those temptations come to try and distort what the Lord is asking us to do, our true vocation, that vocation to be truly human. That vocation to be the son or daughter of the king. That vocation to be a servant to the world and to others. Well, we need to stamp out those lies straight away so they don't come back and trip us up later. We need to rebut the enemy and any lie that are over us so then that doesn't prevent us from becoming the people that God is calling to us to be. Because friends, those of us sat here this morning... Our identity is found in the Lord. Our identity is found as a child of the living God. John Stott describes the temptations that are like that, that affect our calling, that affect our identity as spiritual muscle, as building spiritual muscle, because we know they will come. 
And every time we overcome them, we get that little bit stronger. But if you notice, if we go back to these questions and the temptations that Jesus faced, it's not just, are you the son of God? But it goes further. It's if you're the son of God, well, surely he doesn't want you to be hungry, so change these stones into bread. You can do it. Of course, we know the significance of bread in the Bible. There's the feeding of the 5,000. There's the bread that we use at communion. And at the heart of every human person, we have to eat. Now, I'm absolutely terrible when I get hungry. I get hangry. And when I get too hungry, I can't make a decision. Apparently, it's really annoying to Amanda. <laughs> but Jesus replies with scripture. He replies with Deuteronomy 8.3. You can't live by bread alone. The second temptation is a slight change in tactic from the enemy. He uses scripture this time to try and tempt Jesus to throw himself off the temple. This is Psalm 91. He'll command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you do not strike your foot against the stone. Well, how does Jesus respond to this? Deuteronomy 6.16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. He responds with scripture. The Holy Spirit, which comes up on him at his baptism, took the scriptures and, they, and he uses them in spiritual warfare. And it comes back to Ephesians 6, which we've talked about quite a bit here. It comes back to having that sword of the Spirit, that word of God dwelling in us. So what lesson can we learn from this? We need to know our way around our scriptures, for starters. And we need to trust the Holy Spirit in warfare with the enemy. Because if we do this, when temptation comes, we're more likely to think of scripture to avoid falling into temptation. It's a powerful weapon in the battle that is taking place. We aren't to be tempted by the enemy into the ways of the world, seeking fulfillment in the now, seeking ways that are spiritually unhealthy. Nor must we ever compromise with the enemy. So let me ask you this morning, and me as included, are we therefore committed to living off God's word and to trust in him completely? Jesus is committed to loving and serving God alone. Are we? Our flesh may scream for satisfaction. The world may beckon us seductively. But we can stand firm when we stand on the word of God. When we come to the third temptation, there's a slight deviation away from the other two. This time the enemy doesn't say to Jesus, if you're the son of God. He comes out with something bold and offers Jesus something which isn't his to offer in the first place. The enemy offers the kingdoms of the world, which of course we know already belong to God. And he says it can be Jesus if he bows down and worships him. This to me is striking. In some ways it goes back to what those adverts are trying to do. Something you haven't got but you really need, but you don't need it. The enemy is tempting Jesus to a shortcut for instant satisfaction and gratification without doing anything for it other than surrendering who he is as the Son of God and bowing down before the enemy. It's one of those, well, that offer sounds too good to be true. If you think back to that slide, free cheese is always found in mousetraps. There will always be a consequence. But what I notice in the third temptation, in here the rebuttal, Jesus goes straight in and says, away from me, Satan. He names it there and then. And he follows it up with scripture, Deuteronomy 6.13 this time. How often have we been faced with things and we've tried to sweep them under the carpet or we've looked the other way probably a reason why people say there's always skeletons in somebody's closet but what does Jesus do in this situation 
he names it out loud. Get away from me, Satan. So what is it that the enemy is tempting you with this morning? What is it that perhaps something you're really, really struggling with? And you just need to name it out loud before the Lord. How many of us actually would name it out loud? Or how many of us would, probably like I would do if I was sat there, is look at the ground and think, well, I hope he doesn't look at me. Because it takes, it's, we need to be bold enough to shout it out and say, it's not for me. All three of the temptations that the enemy tries, he's trying to pull Jesus away from his heavenly father. And it's the same when we're tempted to sin. If we fall into sin, our relationship with the father is damaged. We become like Adam and Eve and we want to hide in the garden rather than speak to the Lord about what we've done, rather than bring it into the light. That's why it's so important when we're in church to confess our sins because, of course, we all will sin. We all do. It's, human con- it's the human condition. But the Lord is gracious and merciful. Adam and Eve have a single command, a single temptation, and a devastating result. But Jesus keeps his eye on the Father and he launches a mission to undo the effects of human rebellion. Of course, this isn't the last time that Jesus will be tempted. We read in Luke's version of his account, the devil left him until an opportune time. It's missing from Matthew's gospel, but in Luke's gospel, the devil, it says he will come back. And what do we see elsewhere? Matthew 16. When Jesus says again, get behind me, Satan. And he says it to Peter. He's trying to change Jesus' mind about the cross. In chapter 27, Jesus is hanging on the cross. And what does the thief at his side say to him? If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Again, right into that identity of who Jesus is. And when Jesus refuses the tempter, he embraces the way of the cross. Now the temptations that we face will be different to those that Jesus faces, I'm sure. But they have exactly the same point and exactly the same result if we follow them. It will distract us from the path of servanthood that our baptism has commissioned us to. It comes down to our identity. Our identity has to be found in Jesus Christ. Is your identity found in Jesus Christ? Is my identity found in Jesus Christ? And if it's not, what's stopping us? What's stopping you or me having that identity in Jesus Christ? There's a simple answer. It's the lies that we have been told. It's the lies that we have been told by the enemy, whether it's from a friend, a family member, somebody you don't know, somebody that said, you're not good enough. You can't possibly be a Christian. You do all this bad stuff. It's the enemy that has got into our world and that has tried to take that identity away from you and me. And this morning, I want to call that out. I want to call that out this morning and say, away from us, Satan. You have no place in our lives. You have no place in this church. We, each and every one of us, are children of the living God. We are sons and daughters of the King. And I proclaim that this morning over each and every one of us. The Lord loves each and every one of us gathered here this morning and our brothers and sisters who can't be with us, of course. He wants the best for you and for me. He has a vocation for you and for me. He pours out his love for each of us. If God has called us to do something, he will give us the skills to do it. He will give us those skills. Don't let anybody say to you, you're not good enough. Because that's not, of the, uh, that's not of our Heavenly Father. If you have a sense that you're called to do something or you're weighing up, well, should I or should 
and somebody says, you're not good enough, that is not from the Lord. That's when we have to stand firm and say, away from me, Satan. Because we trust the Lord. It may well require us to take steps of faith. It will require us to take steps of faith. I had to leave my career in law before I would have got anywhere in the ordination process. That's not to say, go and, oh, I've said it before here, but don't go and resign tomorrow. But it will lead us to places that we never thought possible. It will lead us to meet people who we would never normally meet. It will mean that we act differently to our colleagues because we are living as children of the Lord. So we must fully step into our identities of being children of God. Of course, there'll be times when we don't feel like it, times when we want to rest. That's fine. I'm not saying we have to do it 24-7, be out there. We have to look after ourselves in this. But the temptations of Jesus that we read go to his ident true identity. They try and pull him away from our Heavenly Father. So what this morning I ask you is pulling you away from your Heavenly Father, from our Heavenly Father. And I want you to name that out this morning. I want you to name that before the Lord. I want you to say, I'm done with that. If you've been told you're not good enough, you're not worthy, you're not capable of doing what you're doing, shout it out and give it to the Lord and say, I don't want this lie over me anymore. Because I think once we've got rid of those lies that are over us, once we have got, said they're not our true identity, once we know, once we truly, truly know that our identity is found in Jesus, things will happen. On Thursday, Amanda, Wendy, Leslie and I were at a local New Wine Leaders gathering in St. Albans. And during our worship, we were praying. And I had a really vivid picture of this place. And I want to share it with you. Because I think it really speaks into what we're talking about, our identity. I pictured the church from that side. I was looking from the car park at the church. And a fire from heaven came down right into this building. It came down and hit the ground in the middle of this building. But it didn't stop there. A fire then erupted right across our parish of Bushmead. And people flocked to us. But there was something stopping it. And it wasn't until somebody stood up, who I don't know, wasn't it, you know, who just said, got, took up the microphone and said, I've got this sense from the Lord, of gates that needed to be opened to allow the Lord to work. And at that point, I sensed a twig snap in my mind. And I thought, yeah, that's because of our identity. I want to see that happen. I want to see the fire of God fall on this place. I want to see the fire of God reach out into Bushmead. I want to see it beyond Bushmead. I want to see it in the UK and in the world. But we are called to be the church for Bushmead at the moment. So I want to focus on what can we do in Bushmi to bring that fire of God. Because out there, there are so many people who are living a lie. There are so many people out there who have been told, you don't want to go to church, they make you stand and sing on a Sunday morning. Or you don't want to go to church, they make you behave. <laughs> you don't want to go to church, you, you know what I'm saying. So I want to name that this morning. If you will, with me, would you stand? Maybe if you feel comfortable, pop your hands, put your hands out in front of you as a sign of wanting to receive from the Lord. And I want you to think, what lies have been told over you? What lies have been told over you that you have believed? And I want you to name them now and say, I'm done with that. Give them to Jesus. We have that same authority that Jesus has living in us through the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus says, away from me, Satan, and he flees, we too can say, away from me, Satan, and he will flee. So whatever is stopping your identity in Jesus Christ this morning, I want you to name it in front of the Lord. You don't have to shout it out. Do it in the silence if you want. But I want you to name that now before the Lord. And I want each and every one of you to know 
that you are a son and or a daughter of the king. You are a son or daughter of the Lord Most High. And as Charles said last week, we can be bold in that. We can be bold in proclaiming that. Not just to ourselves, not just to each other, but to the world. So name it before the Lord this morning. And then we're going to have a song while we continue. And if you're engaging with the Lord, I encourage you, just continue to receive. You don't have to sing. It'll be fairly quiet in the background. But do business with the Lord this morning. Give him that lie and say, no more. Get behind me, Satan. Because when we say, get behind me, Satan, he will flee.